nice article in the Managing Madrid uh, blog. Uh, wonderful lads that do a great job there. And it's worth reading about that man there. So he bets the man needs to rest and the numbers reveal why. Times ended up almost looking like a 6 3 1. Some very good writing about that on the Managing Madrid website. Such a great podcast as well. Pere Valverde was a huge part of the equation. Hello and welcome to a Saturday edition of the Managing Madrid Podcast. I'm your host, Kian Sobani, and we are recording this about, I don't know, an hour after Real Madrid beat Real Betis 2-1 at the Bernabeu. And uh, just a rare early podcast. It's very rare that we record a podcast when the sun is still this bright out. So an early kickoff on Saturday at the Bernabeu, I don't hate it. It's nice to get work out of the way earlier. So joining me is Matt Wilty. Matt, how are you? Hey, I'm doing well. I think um, what's interesting too is usually those early kickoffs, sometimes the games are a little bit lethargic, in a, and especially Real Madrid, usually I feel like they get off to a slow start, and it's not the same intensity under the light that night, last game of the day, but this one was actually a lot of fun. Two great teams, two teams that were undefeated coming up against each other, and uh, we had I mean, just a ton of great individual performances today on the Real Madrid side. Uh, I thought Canales was fantastic for for Betis. Um, And it was just a it was a fun back and forth game. Yeah, I've been to games that are 12 p.m. local time at the Bernabeu. And that those ones, even I'm lethargic, like even I'm just like dragging myself to the stadium, like, oh, my God, just gotta it's. And so I can't imagine like the player because you can feel it in the players too. The players literally look sluggish. But today wasn't so bad. I think it was like four just after four p.m. local time. But um, so to your point, and Canales had a good game. What was your assessment of the first like fifteen minutes? Because everyone feels that Real Betis were the the stronger side in the opening fifteen twenty minutes or so. And I'm just curious to know what your read on it was. Yeah, I, I probably agree with that assessment. I thought Betis. Started stronger. They were stringing a lot, of pass it together, a lot of session. Um, the the Barnabas, the Burnabay was even frustrated. Like they were whistling, and um, it was it was pretty early on in the game, though. So I just felt like the team just needed to settle and kind of find their place. Um, but yeah, we were. I mean, you look. You even looked at Rodrigo's position defensively. It felt like he was trying to impersonate Fede Valverde and just really tucked in centrally it was he was almost like a a fourth central midfielder and it felt like at times when we were in that defensive shape it was a four one with the one being two of many three and then two with Vinicius and Benzema up top Um, so Rodrigo really kind of dug in and did do that defensive work but after I mean really after we scored because it was what ninth minute so it wasn't even full 15 minutes of Betis um, on the ball, you would say our goal was against the run of play, but really after we scored, that kind of I felt like the team just woke up a little bit, got some more confidence, and found some more rhythm. Um, and so um, after that, it was more of like an even affair. Yeah. So uh, I also think the Rodrigo point is one we should lead with in this podcast. So we'll get to it in a second. But my so my read in the first fifteen minutes, like. I suppose I can agree to that, but I was kind of confused as to the general sentiment was so confident about it because that, really in that first 15 minutes, they didn't create anything, even if they had more of the ball or whatever, they looked more confident with it. They did struggle with a couple early pressing sequences early on, like in the first couple of minutes. Um, and really like after their goal, it's funny because it's their goal that kind of, to me, sealed their their foothold on the game if they had it because after their goal after Canales scores the goal like seconds later Vinicius has that chance to go up 2-1 it's a great chance and then after that it was basically all us uh, apart from like a couple of transition attacks here and there uh, throughout the game very very little from from their end but the reason I thought we could lead with uh, Rodrigo was because you mentioned his role in this game and I thought it was interesting that um, you know, the commentator pointed out a couple times that uh, Betis's left flank. So we're talking about Juanmi, who was on that side, 
Guardado was on that side but not attacking too much, and Alex Moreno was really their other threat who was making these overloads on that side. Just making the point that Alex Moreno is open on that side and Rodrigo needs to be aware of it. I thought Rodrigo did well overall, but I, I will, like, on the defensive side of things, and he worked really hard to press. But what's interesting about him is that I think you and I talked about this after the Espanol game. Espanol game was the last one where Rodrigo had the assist to Benzema, right? Was that last game? Am I mixing it up? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. All right. So, uh, yeah, no, that's right. Okay. So, um, Rodrigo was not providing us with symmetry. And I don't think that's a bad thing. Like, I don't know why. I, I don't even know if anyone would complain about it, but I don't know why we would have to anyway. To, to, so I'm curious to know where you stand on that because when we look at a 4-3-3, the difference between Rodrigo and Fede, it's, I think, in our heads, the difference is initially that, well, Rodrigo brings you more width and he can go at players more. I think the second part is true, but I think the the, the first part hasn't turned out to be true. The real difference between Rodrigo and, and Fede Valverde has really been that when Rodrigo is on the field, he goes to the left side and overloads it, and him and Vinicius and Benzema um, are connecting on that side primarily. And I bring up the Espanol game because obviously Rodrigo provided an assist from the left side in that game coming off the bench. And in this game, he's on the left side constantly, like throughout the game. He probably should have had two assists from that side. Mind you, I also thought he had a couple nice balls into the box on the right side as well, so it wasn't only on the left side, but it was really interesting. So I'm curious to know what your thoughts on his role was and also just the idea of symmetry and how much it matters. It's funny you bring up the point of Fede being actually the player that ends up being providing more width than Rodrigo because I think that's true. Like He he doesn't really – not like the East Coast role when he plays – um, on the right wing, he he plays wide. Uh, he pretty much sticks to the touchline, and so um, yeah, I think Rodrigo actually ventures off more and just wants to bind, wants to be close to the ball. Does do that overload on the left side, and we saw it work to great effect again today, just like it did against Espanol, and it has previously. I actually really like that. Like people complain, oh Rodrigo, like on the right, he's not as good as effective as he is on the left. Well, he just ventures over there and overloads the left-hand side and combines with Vinicius and Benzema and just gets on the ball and, and makes it work. It it is it does make our system a little lopsided. And I think um Alex Moreno did benefit from that sometimes in this match and he was kind of the outlet um out wide for a lot of this game. But I thought it was a good battle between those two. Like it was really fun to watch Alex Moreno and Rodrigo go go at it. Even Rodrigo when usually when he drops his shoulder and does that um little move down the right he usually beats whoever he's going against but moreno is quick enough to to keep up with him um but even even with moreno having a pretty good game i thought rodrigo was excellent like rodrigo obviously scored the game winner. um well like you said could have had two two or three assists in this one um he was just kind of i i really liked what we've seen from him to start the season and it's coming off of a really positive end to last season um, I wrote that article last season talking about how Rodrigo's production numbers at the end of the season were actually just as good, if not better, than Vinicius's start to last season. Um, and so, if he can, if he can keep this up, like he'll he'll have himself a really really solid season. Um, I think I think the expectations are there for him, and rightly there. Like he's got to now shoulder that responsibility because there is hype and pressure around him. And so he's got to perform. And I think thus far he has, and he's looked good. Um, so just continue to get that match rhythm. He's obviously just coming back into the fold, but I liked it. And I think the only blemish, like you said, is maybe Moreno got free one too many times. Um, but the way the way Millie Talley today, it didn't matter. I mean, he literally ate everything in his path. And whoever came down that, that our right side um, – just he he was there to sweep it up yeah Yeah. Militao was genuinely incredible I we'll we'll talk about him in a second um I also thought Rodrigo was great I think he thoroughly deserved that goal you know there were some murmurs like oh the goalkeeper didn't do well fine but he does he just in a vacuum deserved it because he worked so hard and he probably should have had a couple of assists because he had that great um pass to uh Vinicius in the box 
the Benzema miss was that Rodrigo passing? Can't remember. Or was it Vinny? Yeah, yeah, it was from the it was right. Rodrigo. It was Rodrigo from the right. Yeah. Same same type of pass that he fed Vinicius with. Yeah, I mean the amount of chances we created in this game were ridiculous. Like I lost track. The XG was three point two, Betty's point three three. The Benzema chance was insane. It was like literally on the line. And then Vinicius was just outside the six yard box. Alaba had a great chance from a corner kick. And then we had a high volume of shots. I think we had 22 shots. So we thoroughly deserve to win this game. Um, the opening goal, can you break that down for us? The 1 0? Well, uh, you did. You put a nice uh, montage on your Instagram and Twitter of. Uh, oh damn! What you, you saw could. that already? Quick. On, yeah, I saw that. It's uh, I. I didn't even notice that in real time. Uh, Instagram stories obviously. is the last safe space to post uh, highlights. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so who, those who haven't seen it, go check it out. But Keon posted a video of like basically Benzema and Vinicius making inverted runs. So Benzema checks to the ball, drags the center back with him, and then Vinicius takes advantage of that by curving his run across the shoulder of the back line and combing right through them. And um, like it was really cool to see that. And then just kudos to Alaba because inch perfect ball. Uh, picks his head up like that's right where you want Alba carrying the ball up the field and then just playing a beautiful quarterback pass which he's capable of doing uh, into Vinny's feet and Vinny this is this is Vinny we know and love now he keeps he keeps his composure in front of goal scores the goal third consecutive game and I truly believe like out of all our talented youngsters like we often get the question who's the most talented, who has the highest ceiling. Like it's got to be Vinicius. Vinicius is the real superstar and this is going to be his team and um it's just it's fun seeing him evolve and like keep this form going after last season and he truly is a superstar. Like there's no doubt about it. Yeah, it was almost his ceiling was always going to be the highest. It was we 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 said that this even years ago uh when people were asking, but uh you know, if a fun game to play would be like, what would the Vinicius of 2019 have done with a pass like that? You know, does he, like, I, I have no idea. But I think it, whatever it is, I don't think it's what we saw today. And I think that's a testament to how much he's grown and how much he's been able to slow the game down for himself mentally because he was very calm and he just chipped it. It was beautiful. It was it was gorgeous. The control was great. The, the finish was great. As you said, Alaba's ball progression, fantastic. What a ball. And yeah, the Benzema thing I didn't see in real time either. I was just going back and watching it after the game ended, and I just noticed, and I was trying to look at everything. And and God, God forbid we ever enter an era again where we're allowed to talk about Benzema doing things um, when he's not scoring. But he just—it's smart because it, it looked like something that they were on the same page on, like something they had talked about in the past, something they, they knew, something they practiced in training. Where if that ball is on that side. You don't make the same run. You make opposite runs. And what essentially happened was at the same time they start realizing and they make that run, Benzema makes a, a run where he comes back to show as an outlet. He drags that center back. I don't know who it was. And then Vinicius makes that run to the channel exactly where the center back got dragged away and then he gets pretty much a breakaway. So, yeah, it was really impressive. Um, where do you stand on the whole Benzema Benzema's poor start finishing wise. Yeah. Yeah. Um I think he will come good. Like I'm I'm confident that we'll see Benzema from last year. Like I don't think this is his drop off or any, or his de- the start of his decline or anything. Um even you pointing out that run like just kind of reiterates that for me. Everything he brings to the table off ball. Uh I may I think I only gave him like a six or a six and a half or something That's in fair. player ratings today. Um but I think he still contributed with three key passes. Like he still had that in his game and that's kinda the level he brings. Like even when it's not his day, he still has little touches and little passes and movement that um uh, kinda goes unnoticed but brings so much to this side. And so I guess the one criticism of him today was no shots on target. He didn't have a single shot on target. And he obviously, I don't know if that one was offsides, but the one that uh, Rodrigo played a cross goal, he just literally had to tap in. Um, it just feels like something, like it almost feels like it is kind of playing his mind a little bit. 
um, that he knows he's not playing as well at the start of the season. But I think once he gets into a groove, this will kind of work itself out. I have to say also, as you're as you as you were talking there, I think I just realized because that that miss would have been offside, but it didn't get called offside because they didn't need to review it, right? Because it didn't go in. And it eventually was called a handball after the play. So that actually inflates Real Madrid's XG quite a bit because it's a 0.75. It's literally a higher percentage than a penalty. And it stays in the XG chart because it didn't get called back for offside. Uh, it was just something that uh, was interesting to note. Um, yeah, with I, if I had to guess, Matt, and I'm pretty confident of this, I think like we'll look back at the end of the year and we won't even remember this this phase from Benzema again because he's like he's very active on the ball he's not shy he's I'm not worried about him in that sense I do have a question for you actually first I'll scar you for a little bit I don't know if you saw Carlo Ancelotti's post-game quotes did you see it yeah I saw all right so for the listener's sake among many quotes he said I'll just mention this one right now um he was asked about Benzema's physical uh physical aspect I guess like his physical shape if he if if the reason he's missing chances is because of something uh, physically or if he's tired. Uh, this is the quote. It is not true that he does not have substitutes. He has many, like Mariano, Hazard, Rodrigo, sometimes Asensio. And if he would have stopped there, it would have been fine. But he went one more further and he said, and even Modric. Um, so I don't know why he had to throw that last name in there to just bring up bad memories. And I really hope that... Uh, we don't that's like that's like plan that's like plan z that's like really i wouldn't even break that in case of emergency i'd rather like put you on or something or like get get the, the chair way, from the stands <laughs> the way uh you wrote it in the uh in his um post-match quotes for management it made it seem like carlo was kind of joking though so okay that's uh, great I so think... ewan literally was in the press room so <laughs> that would be helpful yeah. to have that context all right yeah. uh okay so but but more <clears throat> more seriously matt um uh the rest of the quote we're not going to kill him he's yeah, the fact that he plays every three days can mean that he does need to rest the game. But so far, with one game a week, I've seen him do well. Today, he was he wasn't great, but his finishing was not because of his physical um, shape. Uh, end quote. I did have a question because a lot of the the dialogue is, well, we need the backup striker so that Benzema, so that if Benzema is out of form he can sit on the bench in favor of this backup striker. I don't, I'm trying to understand that train of thinking because I'm not really sure if I do, because what does that mean? Because to me, this goes back to saying something along the lines of we should get a backup to Cristiano Ronaldo because if Cristiano Ronaldo is out of form, we can bench him because you're not benching Cristiano Ronaldo if he's out of form. Just like you're not benching Karim Benzema if he's out of form. You know what I mean? You let the shooter shoot through the slump. You have to let him play through it. You don't bench someone like him because he's out of form and not scoring. Because then he's not gonna he's gonna lose more confidence and he's not he's gonna get in his head, he's not gonna have that. So I don't know if like that actually makes sense to me. And I'm willing to concede that I might be wrong on that, but I just don't see it because like you don't I, I understand benching him to rest him. I understand benching him for that part. That that reasoning makes sense to me. But to bench someone of his caliber for being out of form doesn't make as much sense to me. I'm not sure what that means. So I'm just curious to know what you where you stand on that and on just on that whole spectrum. We've seen the sample size be long large enough now that like you're not going to bench Kareem Benzema and you shouldn't bench Kareem Benzema. Even when he's not playing well, like he did last Espanol game, he scored two goals in the dying minutes of the match and overturned the result for it. He's done that countless times last season. Like to your point, Keon, he is of that level playing like Cristiano was and Messi was and at least last season. And you don't take that player off even when they're off even when they're playing poorly because they can always produce something. And so um, I think Carlo's kind of right with the point he made saying like, look, we have all these other guys that, yeah, maybe they're not a natural striker, but 
we can work around that. And we, if the only time they're really going to have to play there is when we're resting Benzema and God forbid he gets the only issue is obviously if he gets like a major injury, but if that happens, let's say he gets major injury now, like we would be able to sign in January. And then if he got a major injury in the spring or after January, like, yeah, then you're kind of in a tough spot and you're going to have to make one of those like false nine rules work, whether it's Rodrigo, Asensio, Hazard, whoever you want to put there, um, you're just going to have to make it work. But I, I, I think we've seen for how many seasons now with Mariano and Jovic and all the other strikers we've had in the past, the only one that really got a fair chunk of rotation minutes was Morata um, and Higuain, I guess, when he was here. But Benzema, Benzema wasn't playing at the level he is now. Um, and isn't as important as a leader and a captain that he is now. And so uh, I think it's just a, it's a, it's a different ex- Benzema experience now. And I, I just don't think there really is a role like that backup role doesn't really exist anymore. Um, yeah. I mean, the reality is it's just going to be whoever we have in basically, I think in the exact order that, let me see what order he put it in again. He, he said, uh, Oh, I hope not, because he did put Mariano first. Um, I, to me, the order is actually Rodrigo number one as the false nine, and then whoever you want to put as your third attacker, do it. Probably Asensio makes oh, Asensio or Fede, probably Fede. Um, but yeah, it's, but um, yeah, I think it's just going to be Rodrigo or Hazard or Asensio false nine, and so that's what's going to happen. Um, we'll talk about Hazard and Asensio. I think we have a segment reserved for them every single podcast because they just never play. But uh, Ancelotti did talk about them as well. What is the natural progression? Oh, I guess the 1-1. One, one. Um, who's to blame on the throw-in? So I watched a couple times over, um, and it's funny that the, the throw-in result actually after Alex Moreno comes barreling down our right hand side and it was a weird play where he like just kind of I don't know if he nutmegged Carvajal or what but like Carvajal whiffed the ball when he tried to tackle it and Alex Moreno just kept going uh ultimately Chuameni closes him down and the ball goes out for a throw in and I watched this a couple times it was it looked like it was Modric who just had a lapse in concentration he really should have been the one marking Canelas um and should have been goal side of him too and then Kamavinga and Carvajal like try to cover for Modric and like just put pressure on uh Canales but it in the end it really was a lapse in concentration for Modric yeah that's interesting I, I actually haven't watched that one uh since so I wasn't sure either and I from what I saw in real time it was I thought maybe Carvajal should pick up Canales and but he seemed like he was marking the thrower and um Kamavinga already has his man too but so he's not really in position to cover either I definitely didn't want any blame on Militao on that one because I saw a few people blaming Militao for that. But I think I think that's just some Real Madrid fans just like put up their hand and say it's Militao at fault no matter what happens, even yeah. if he's on the bench. So uh, that's that. Um, any uh, uh, any concern for you on <clears throat> the fact that we haven't been able to keep a clean sheet yet? Um, I think. The goals we've conceded have all been down to a lapse or so, right? I'd have to look back and go through because, like, I I don't remember off the top of my head. Because there are goals you can see that are just like collective breakdowns. I think there was one I can't remember which game it was that we actually conceded a goal where I thought like that was just a really good. I think it was against Rio, um, where I think we just um, was it again? Let me just check. Am I? Did we play Ryo? Am I making that up in my head? I think you are. <laughs> Hold on. I was trying to think if we played Ryo. I'm bringing up my no- Oh, so, sorry. Almeria. Almeria. It's okay, the okay. it's the color scheme that threw me off. Almeria. <laughs> um, the, I think it was the, the goal they scored against us. That was like a combination of really good... Uh, just combination play and passing from Almeria, which I thought we could have did better on. It was a high line. That was the kind of the Rudiger thing too. But I don't know. Like a lot of these goals that we can see, generally speaking, are like extremely preventable. But we're so 
we're so good individually and we have so much star power up front that it just tend, doesn't tend to matter. So am I worried about it? I'm worried about it for sure to an extent that um, I know we're going to concede. But the question to me is because I know that Real Madrid, the way we play, we'll, we will never be airtight defensively. I also know that just comes with the territory of being this good offensively and also the, enough individual brilliance to mask it that it doesn't matter if we concede one if we're scoring three or four. Like, look, go down the list, Matt. Like, so we've, we scored two today. We probably should have had three or four. Three against Espanyol, four against Celta, and then two against Almeria, which was the first game of the season. That actually might have been the more difficult one. But I, um, I'm worried about it in the sense that I know we're going to concede. But I don't know how much to worry about it in the sense that I think knowing that we will concede and knowing this is the way Real Madrid has been basically since I've been alive, apart from like a couple years here and there, that we're just going to expect some of these lapses. But then it may not matter if we if we just have such a high volume of outscoring our opponents. And we're still pretty good defensively still, I would say. And I think we're going to improve once Rudiger gets incorporated. But, you know, I'm not I'm not. I'm not more worried about it this year than I am than I than I was like let's say than last year. What are your thoughts on it? Well, I I much prefer these performances and these results um, to kind of like the Zidane controlled one nils that yeah. we saw in the past. Uh, sure. So like this, in terms of entertainment, has been more fun, and I like the fact that we're creating so much and. We're seeing a lot from Vinicius, Rodrigo, um, Benzema, even Fede. So, like, those types of things I, I just prefer. And you think about there was a moment um, Carball had a uh, two really good ball, two really good passes in this game, one where he ended up, like, kind of in inverted central midfield position, chips it to Benzema, which just missed him. And then a short corner kick that Carvajal whipped in in the first half that – um, I think it, it it almost hit Benzema and Militao. They were both going for it. And, I mean, those like those types of things, like you said, we created plenty in this match. And so that's the more encouraging thing for me. That's more entertaining as well. So as long as we're creating enough to offset some of these goals conceded, then I don't think it's anything to worry about just yet. I, yeah, I think if we were just playing really poorly and this would have been like two, three, four, five mistakes in the game, I think you'd be more worried about it, I guess is my point. And I think as the season goes on, the more urgent it becomes, then I think you start to lock down some of these things. I also think that, you know, you can't argue with 12 points from, from 12 available points. We got it. We're the only undefeated team in the league now. And so that, that you can't argue with that either. So um, I think overall... And honestly. Well, just honestly, too, Real Betis didn't create anything besides the goal. Like, no, that was didn't. it. They didn't. Yeah. Well, they they got into good positions through transition attacks, but Militao and Chuomeni basically ate them up, which I think... We probably should say uh, we got fortunate that one of their best players got, got injured within, like, 10 minutes of the game starting. So. Yeah, I think it was the, within 15 minutes, I think, Fekir comes off hamstring injury that was pretty devastating for them that actually does also coincide by the way with their kind of dip um in in control a little bit it was basically we yeah th that actually had a before and after point for them Fakir's injury i think was was devastating for them uh pellegrini said after the game that him and carvalho are two players that are really important for them in the build-up phase. And obviously, Carvalho wasn't in this game. He was injured, and Fekir came off injured. So that was pretty devastating for them. Um, we should we should talk about Chiuameni and Militao. We'll talk about Chiuameni first. Settling in nicely, Matt, I thought the coverage from him across the back line was amazing. He was winning... He was winning balls. He had six aerials won. The one where he leaps on the corner and basically dunks on the Real Betis defense single-handedly was amazing. It was brilliantly saved by Rui Silva. Protects the back line. He was shielding it all night. Tackling was good. Coverage was good. I think he actually won the, the de facto man of the match that La Liga gives out. I'm not sure. I saw I saw that. Um, talk to me about you, Manny. Yeah, he did win that man of the match award, um, and thoroughly deserved. Along like Militao's the other argument, but thoroughly deserved for Chuomeni. Um 
this is exciting. This is really exciting to see him playing this well already. His first 45 minutes and at home and he gets the crowd like he got countless applause and that's what i love like he felt the warmth from the fans uh, i think that only improved his confidence they recognized the interventions making his composure on the ball um and he was just a crucial crucial cog in this one and it's really encouraging like when a player plays like this you quickly forget the legend that just left because he's playing so well obviously it's really early days so we don't want to kind of overhype him and like there will be as we've seen with a lot of young players there's peaks and valleys and in general with the team we great start and there will be peaks and valleys with this team too like there will come a point where we dip whether it's in december january whenever it is we will have a dip um and we just gotta ride through it but i think um i'm i'm loving the chew many experience so far and i, I saw a stat i want to try and pull it up that uh he won I think he had like 19 duels or something and he won 16 or 17 and no Real Madrid player has ever won that many in a single game since Sergio Ramos versus Valencia in like 2016 or something. Wow. So yeah, I'm going to try and find it uh, just to make sure I said that accurately, but it is like that kind of puts, uh, yeah, here it is. Chua many had 19 duels against Real Betis and won 16. Since 2005, 2006, among Real Madrid players with 19 plus duels in a single game, only Sergio Ramos in May of 2014 versus Valencia, who had eight, uh, won tw- 18 of his 20 duels, had a better dual success rate than the Frenchman. So that's, that's insane. Since 2005, 2006, yeah. So what way to to make your introduction? And uh, I I think this will only do his confidence a world of good. And as he gets integrated into the team, and um, he was just just fantastic. Like can't say enough good things about him. That's an incredible statistic. I just thought I also just retweeted it to spread the pop propaganda. You know, like I will say, like I think a lot of people, the ones who doubted too many, pretended that he was some kind of um, overhyped youngster. When in reality, is he's 22 and he's already starting for the French national team. Like, we didn't need to pretend yeah. that he was some kind of teenager or something that wasn't yeah. ready. Like, he was pretty yeah. polished, and that should be remembered. Um, so, the him getting integrated at this rate, it's still like even an experienced player needs to get integrated into a new new team and a new league. So, that so the fact that even, even despite him not being a teenager and being integrated already is pretty remarkable. So, game high in tackles, in addition to what you said, game high four interceptions. Um, this is an awesome chew of many game. Is this also the best Militao game in, I don't know how long, but it, this was more like early season last year Militao. Yeah. Yeah, this was even uh, his kind of like breakout period under Zidane when uh, Ramos and Varane were injured. He had like a run of games where he was starting with Nacho and he was unreal. I remember tweeting out like, oh, this is the guy we signed. This is the guy that was Portugal defender uh, of the month for five months in a row. And uh, I felt like that today. Like everything that came in his path, he just destroyed. Like can I, I keep thinking of that one play where Canales was through um, on a breakthrough, on a breakaway counterattack, and Militao yep. just bodies him and just no no chance, no chance for Canales. And he just gets out of there. And one thing that I think has uh, been underrated, which he's been doing really well, he's always had it in his locker, but I don't know if – if he's been using it as much. Um, And one thing he's done really well at the start of the season is his long diagonal balls to Vinicius. He is hitting those on a dime every single time. Um, And that's a weapon. I mean, we know how well Sergio Ramos used to do that. So if Militao can continue to add that to his toolbox and use it, um, kind of get it, get it going um, repetitively in, in matches, then, uh, that will be open for us, and I think his long range passing is probably one of his underrated skill sets. Can we speak about um, Alaba and Mendy for a second? Because we mentioned Alaba briefly during the talk when discussing the first goal. Funny enough, I don't know if I actually, I don't think I really um, noticed Mendy get into the final third until like the 70th minute. That was like the first time I noticed him, and I think at around that same time he sets up Modric, and Modric is 
Shot goes just wide in the second half. Forces a corner. Uh, today felt like last season, the whole Mendy Alaba swapping thing. Alaba's position like was all over the place in a good way. He was a left center back at times. He was a left back. He was an inverted left back. There was often where just so many times where he goes forward and Mendy just stays back. I think still think that's the best solution for them to get the best out of both of those guys. That's the best way. It's working. Uh, why not, why tinker with it? So uh, just Mendy. Any notes on him or Alaba? That that entire side. I yeah, I think this was Mendy's best performance season so far, and not that he was amazing, but he just hasn't really been that good in uh, some of our other games so far, and so. Uh, this was more of the Mendy of w- what we know and love. Like just anybody trying to go down his side has no chance. Um, and he was like Millie Tao. I mean, he was a brick wall. I can't think of one opportunity or even just Betty's really developing anything down our left flank. Um, and that that's a, a big part of that's down to Mendy and, and Alaba, obviously. And um, yeah, I think we even saw that on the goal, like you men, uh, Alaba stepping forward and then Mendy just staying back and t- starting to tuck in. That's, that's all they have to do. Um, and it, and it works so well and it gets the best out of Alaba because he is, I mean, he, he I, I wrote this in my Monday musings, like, tell me if you think this is outlandish. I said, I think he's one of the most complete players Real Madrid have ever signed. Like just period end of he can he I could feel comfortable with him playing almost any position, he's he's that complete. The short list in my head is Di Stefano, um, Nacho can play across the back four, but you can't put him in terms of the category and the level we're talking about. Yeah, um, Modric basically very versatile, Guti. Yeah, but Alaba is like, but Alaba literally can play anywhere in defense or midfield. But we haven't seen him play in midfield. But um, where do you yeah. feel comfortable with him as like a left winger, even too? I'm not probably, saying it'd be his best position, but he'd still be good. <laughs> he wouldn't look terribly out of place, probably. Yeah, if he did. Yeah. That. Um. So there's uh, still a lot to go through in this game. Um. I don't know. Where do you want to go? We can talk about. Let's randomly take a question right now. There's a question from a patron, Ian Marley. He says, uh, here are some post Betty's match thoughts. Kamavinga lost a lot of balls today. He seemed so hesitant to release teammates. People hyping up his game today got me confused. And two, Chu Meni's vertical passing is such a breath of fresh air. Casemiro used to make me want to pull my hair out when he would just blank teammates and avoid vertical verticality like the plague. Chiuameni's passing gets me so excited. We already talked about Chiuameni. Uh, what were your thoughts on Kamavinga's performance? Yeah, I think the question that comes out now with Kamavinga is: Should he just be kind of that impact to a guy that runs? who runs against tired legs and just brings a freshness and vibrance and energy to the game. Um, at, at least at this stage of his career, that's, that's the question that's being proposed. I think, yes, he has been better as an impact substitute for sure, but we got to remember he has started a couple games the season prior to this. Um, and I think it was, was it against Almeria? Um, try, I'm trying to remember which game it wasn't the first game this season, but the second South where up. he started, and yeah, and that's where both he and Chu and Manny were much improved, and he started that game. Um, and so I don't know. We obviously have a decent sample size last year when he started, and he would get early yellow cards, and then Carlo would yank him off at halftime. So I don't. Maybe he's not quite there yet, but I wouldn't. I wouldn't give up on it. Um, I think I like how Carlo has been rotating this squad and just giving minutes out. And we know the 17 to 18 players that are going to have a major role this season. They all, they've all played in these games. Uh, like Hazard 
Howard and Asensio are going to be on the perf. They're not going to be part of that 17 to 18 names. Like they'll get minutes, but they're not going to be in the 2000 minutes plus category unless we see some major injuries. And um, what I like, and I know I'm kind of jumping ahead, but it's like even guys like Ceballos, he's played every single game this season. He hasn't started, uh, but he's played every single game this season. And so uh, I think that's good. I think that's encouraging. And we know like the roles are clearly defined at this point. And Carlo took the lesson learned from the end of last season of trusting his squad and trusting his players and giving these young guys more minutes. And he's implementing it now at the start of the season. That was one of our concerns was, will he rotate? Um, and he is. And so I think let's just keep keep it going with the Kamavinga. We're still getting the wins. We're still uh, – and we just got to work through it with a teenager, like let him develop. And it's it's not like he's playing so poorly that he can't uh, keep getting some more starts under his belt. I thought he was fine. I, I didn't – like. I don't think he was great or amazing, but I also don't think he needs to be singled out for a poor performance necessarily. I, you know, the main criticism of him in this game was that he gave the ball away a couple times. Um, while that's maybe true or like inattentive at times um, with certain sequences, but his passing overall was good. He had a couple of really nice balls down the flank to Vinicius. He roamed horizontally as an outlet, showed for his, for his teammates. Tackling was pretty good. There was a whole stretch of like four minutes, I would say, in the second half where he was basically the team's left back sprinting back when Mendy and Albo were both high up the pitch and covering that side. Yeah, I, yeah. I think the criticism in this game was that he, I think he overcooked a couple of his touches and maybe could have passed it quicker and not got himself into trouble, but you know. This was, I think I lost count of how many times I heard the commentator say today, Kamavinga is still learning. But it's kind of true. Um, no yellow card, though, today, right? Did he avoid a yellow for once? Yeah, no he yellow. did. And there were a couple of tackles where I thought he was going to get one, but he, he avoided it. Um, the, the, the game-winning goal, Fede comes in off the bench he, like immediately gets an assist. That's my favorite Fetty thing. Like he just makes that subtle off ball run and Carvajal hits him and then in one motion essentially the defense is broken and, and Fede cuts it back to Rodrigo. I just thought there was like something symbolic about that moment in that a lot of Rodrigo Fede debates. Rodrigo stays in the game, Fede does come on, they both stay on the field, they both combine for the goal, and Rodrigo is basically like in the middle, like playing the central left wing role when Fede comes in, um, it worked. So funny enough, I think Fede, um, I'd have to look at who, who he came in for, but was he in the right wing this, this game or was he in center mid? He started in center mid and then when Cruz and Ceballos came on, he went, to he went right. Wing. Yeah. Makes sense. Um, but even so that run that you talk about, like that Fede's run now, like that late arriving run yep. uh, from midfield, that is his run. And that's the run Modric used to make. Like that's the run he made in the Champions League final against Juventus. Um, and that's something that Fede should just use time and time again because it's so devastatingly effective. And even right before that play, right when he came in, um, doing what Fede does, he won the ball high at the pitch, like pressing really high. And like just immediately made an impact. And then right after that uh, is when he, he got the assist. So uh, he was just perfect substitute, well-timed Credit to Carlo again for getting that right. And um, what I, another thing I'm going to point out, which I pointed out against Espanol, we had the too many Fede to Vinicius goal. This was obviously uh, Fede Rodrigo combining like the the transition is now these youngsters are contributing now it's happening before our eyes like this is um these guys are are making the impact and it's so easy to forget like we're living it we're going through it right now there's uh everyone should go read managingmajor.com right now we're like what 2 hours after the game finished we have 1 2 3 4 5 post game pieces up already and uh Sam Leverage just published his three stats. There's always really cool information in there. You mentioned one of the stats, Matt, uh, which was the uh, Kamavinga stat, you know, since since uh, Ramos, the duels won. The other two, Vinicius is the first time he scored three games in a row. Does that surprise you? Oh, wow. 
Yeah, I thought he did last season. I guess not. Um, and we've won four games. Our first op- four games in La Liga. Can can you guess how many times that's happened in Real Madrid history? If you had to put a number Ooh. on it, three times. Oh, that's lower than I thought you were going to say. Seven times. This is. I think this is. This is the seventh. Oh wow! Possibly the eighth. But yeah, that, I thought it was going to be more than that. When was the last time? Uh, I just closed the tab. Did he say? <laughs> he does say <laughs> I closed the tab though. But uh, I'll, I'll bring that back up in a second. Um, all right, where where are we? I this is a cool Carlo quote after the game. Thought you would appreciate this one. Um, quote: It doesn't cost me anything to convince Cruz and Modric um, to take lesser roles or play lesser minutes because they are intelligent and humble. They know they are important even if they don't play. Managing them is the easiest thing I've had to do in my career. Culture. Speaks to the culture. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's awesome. I mean, that's what you want. Yeah. It's, what else stood out to you? Especially with what, um, I think I just kind of continue with the theme of the substitutes. I think Bo got right in every substitution. And I thought um Ceballos again was another standout just another fireball of energy when he came on um has nice touches some ta- tackles winning the ball high up the pitch like he's definitely I'm happy to see him continue to get minutes continue to be an important role player um I hope he renews I know he probably wants to return home and uh be a starter week in and week out but Maybe, I mean, the grass isn't always greener and you're you're playing for Real Madrid, your dream. You're finally, it didn't look like you were ever going to have that important of a role and you're finally like a contributing member and you're winning trophies. Like maybe just enjoy that for a couple more years or, and then, then go to Betis. Like I, I would like to see him stay. Um, the thir- The last time I think this has happened was 16, 17, by the way. So, oh, okay, not that, that, not that, that not that long ago. So, one, two, three, four, five. So, uh, it hasn't. Not all seven times have led to a league title. In in fact, we also did this in two thousand nine, two thousand ten, when Pellegrini himself was in charge, and we lost the league title that year. Obviously, I think was that the freak year where we had like a million points and we still lost because Barcelona. Yeah, we had over a hundred points. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that I suppose there's a caveat, like sometimes no matter what you do, if you're going up and it gets opponent like that, it can be difficult. But yeah, so it's a, it's a good start so far. So far, so good. Um, <clears throat> we didn't talk about Vinicius' performance much. What were your thoughts on him? Uh, first half, I just thought he was phenomenal, like electric, cutting inside, getting the best of Salabi. Uh, or how do you say his name? I think that's it, Salabi. Sal- Salabi, um, I think. Who had a nightmare of a game, by the way. Oh, sorry, Sabali, yeah, I think like, it is. Bad game. Sabali. Uh, yeah. yeah, Vinicius just tortured him. Um, and I, I I, still can't get over that run for the goal. Like It was just perfect, well-timed, intelligent run. Uh, that's what he's doing now, and that's kind of to, to devastating effect. I thought second half, a little bit quieter. I actually thought Rodrigo was probably better in the second half um, than Vinicius. But still, like I, I just it's been a great start to the season for him. I thought the, the the confidence and swagger were were pretty apparent, and he looked really good. I mean, just his composure again. Like I, I swear, it's like everything now. I I just noticed it threefold now. Ever since Benzema did that thing where he's showing him his hand and telling him what to do, I swear, like every time now when Vinicius has the ball on the left flank, he's so composed and controlled. He Gets it. Like today he had one where he cuts in and he keeps dropping his shoulder, cutting in all the way and then finds Benzema wide open in the box. There are other times he just looks up and makes the right pass. He doesn't just hit it in the box blindly. And I think that's really, really, really good. Uh, So, yeah, another good Vinicius game. Obviously scored a goal. All right, you tell me what else you have. I'm going to do a quick scan of my notes. Hopefully I don't have too much left. Do you have anything? Um, I don't think so. I think we, I think we covered all the individual performances, the subs. Should we call in Omar Arvin really for an extra hour? To do. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, too many Kamavinga, Benzema, Modric, Alaba, Rodrigo, Mendy, Militao, Carvajal, Vinicius. Um, yeah, okay. I think that's that's good. Um, all right, so game games come thick and fast now. So we have an insane amount of games in October. Celtic uh, midweek. Yep. And then following week, I think we have our. I think it's RB Leipzig and Atleti. I think it is. Yeah, um, back so to back. That will be a tough week. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So yeah, it's going to be crazy. We're all basically all hands on deck from now until the season ends. Um, Tuesday is the Celtic game. We're going to do a live Zoom post game podcast exclusively for patrons. So if you like our work, you want to be a part of this, go over to patreon.com slash managing Madrid. You'll get a Zoom link and you'll join us after the game on Real Madrid's first Champions League game of the season away to Glasgow against Celtic. And after that game, we're going to break that down on Zoom and you can join it. And if you can't make it, I mean, it's great if you can make it because it's just, it's, Definitely being there is, is better because you can ask questions. You can interact in the chat box. We'll do video, screen sharing, breakdowns. If you can't make it, you'll get access to the audio after if you're a patron. But again, patreon.com slash managing Madrid. And Matt, before we wrap it up, we're going to give a quick shout out to our $10 plus patrons. Because if you pledge $10 or more, not only do you get guaranteed responses to your questions, but you also get guaranteed response. Uh, I just said that. You also get a specific shout-out on the podcast. So shout-out to our $10 plus patrons as follows. Brandon Alvarez, Willie Reed, Will Sousa, Way Pairing, Wamik Jamal, Tyler Simon, Tobias Royal Botcher, Tarek Goktas, Talib Salhab, Tahmid Kalam, Sujaiwani, Sumanchu Singh, Sherry Soriel, Sheikh Hatiri, Shamil, Shabazz Sharapov, Sergio Arispe, Santos Solorsano, Samuli Justin, Samir Z, Said Mahad, Sai Mohan, Sasi Kumar, Rodrigo Balmaceda, Rishi D, Phoenix, Peter Powell, Paulo Fierro, Pachko Diafari, Oscar Barrera, Nico Laxo, Nicholas Zapatero Zubiare, Nicholas Moller, Nick Ribeiro, uh, Muxith Thengal, Nelson Masariego, Mowgli, MJ Diego, Michael Zinberg, Marin Myrtle, Matthew Atkins, Martin Ridman, Magnus Lext, Logan Stahl, Leon Stavernakis, Kunal Tilakar, Crystal Glass, Kevin Rivera, Jose Cruz, John Fernandez, Jeff Thurston, Jason Fitz, Ian Marley, Graham Gerard, Gary Cohut, Frederick Rantakiro, Frederick Sundros, Faisal Hamdan, S.A. Davisito, Eloy Enriquez, Edward Sossman, Daniel Williams, Khan P., Christian Toff, Christian Acosta, Charles Williams, Brendan Powers, Brandon Stevens, Ashik Bashar, Armand Gashi, Armando L, Antons Rudenko, Anirud Singh, Ananya Kumar, Al, Azaz Hussein, Adrian Rios, Adar Zalikovic, Adam Dorsey, Bella Chow, Varun, Ramtin, Magrur, Fabian Moreno, and Daniel Smith. Thank you guys. You guys are legends. Appreciate your support. Matt, thanks, man. Appreciate it. We'll chat Tuesday, right? Yep. Thanks, Kyle. All right. We'll chat Tuesday on patreon.com slash Thanks, Matt. Thanks, everyone, for listening, and take care.